What's up guys, it's DK. Welcome to Thorne's YouTube channel. Why are you even here though? Didn't you know Ginger Man bad? Oh hey, aren't you a cute little guy? What's that? What's that? How's, how's things going in the energy drink market? Rough, rough. Oh, it's rough, is it? It's my little doggy dude talking about... Don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious, da -da, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious, da -da, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious, don't be suspicious. Girl, don't do it. It's not worth it. I'm not going to do it, girl. I was just thinking about it, girl. I did it. Nobody's going to know. How would they know? How would they know? TikTok, you know what time it is? Gamer Sups time. So just like that app takes 10% off your IQ when you view it. Get 10% off your Gamer Sups order with the code THORIN, T-H-O-R-I-N, at GamerSups.gg. Now, I'm back for another one of my Patreon video AMAs, aka Thorin vs. Patreon questions. This is episode 24. If you want to take part in one of these, donate $10 or more to my Patreon. And in that month, you will be able to submit a question to the thread. There'll be one linked in the description box below. Or if you connect your Discord uh, channel to your Patreon account, then you can go into the channel there and submit a question, as some of these people did. So we'll start with Pranogo, who actually recently appeared on an episode of Elo Heaven with. And it says, Your answer to N.A. Kefuffle's last question about an LCS trailer sparked my curiosity for the upcoming PGL CSGO Major. As someone who thoroughly enjoyed the hype content surrounding Flashpoint 2, I'd like to know what storylines and grudge matches you'd play up in advance of what many will consider to be the biggest tournament of the year. Now, the trouble with these sorts of topics is, in theory, I shouldn't answer because it's like, I should just get them to hire me to do it, and so I shouldn't just leak my good ideas. It should be like, you know, the joker, like, if you're good at something, never I do it for free but it's but actually my style in fact how i've actually gained most of my opportunities and a lot of very very good friends in the industry is to just give ideas out and then see what happens with it so i won't go as ham as i would if i was making the video but obviously i have to guess because we're still miles away from that major so i would say the obvious overarching one assuming their teams are both relevant is simple versus zewu it's like a battle of the ages right that's just an easy angle to go with and i think quite frankly no major has ever made a real attempt to actually highlight the superstar players which is bonkers to me when you consider how like the nfl the nba approach it if you're gonna go with teams the obvious angle in terms of a team is like if Astralis still have the same five of the ones that won all the majors, then will they be able to return to the major? Because I suspect by then they won't be a top team, maybe not even an elite team, quite frankly. I think if you want to go with the whole CIS angle, like Na'Vi versus Virtus Pro, assuming Virtus Pro continues to be very good, and Na'Vi's still a relevant team, who's the best CIS team? Who's going to place the highest? Remember last time, Virtus Pro, the core of it, outplaced Na'Vi at the major, although Na'Vi's on a much harder side of the bracket. Team Liquid and FaZe are teams who are battling to become elite. I would hope by then they both are elite. So if FaZe is elite, then this is Carrigan's last chance. This is Fallen's last chance. Fallen versus Carrigan, classic rivalry. There's a million angles you can go with that. So you can see where you're going. Like, you see how quickly and easily you just generate those storylines. What's bizarre is you don't know people at ESL, etc. They put in a lot of time to these things. They're just bad at it and they don't hire the competent people because the people doing the hiring aren't competent and therefore you never get it because they have a positive imagination. And a kerfuffle says, this is an over-the-top premise. Oh, by the way, I remember this. This is actually fucking nightmare to read, but we'll read it anyway. Kool-Aid is comparable to narratives. So, okay. There are many flavors. Perhaps the Kool-Aid is spiked by the adolescent nature of public opinion creating a circus. Maybe it has been poisoned by the cult of hardcore fanboys and anti-fans. On certain occasions, one makes the beverage using the zero sugar variation to placate as many people as possible. I'd also just say, by the way, sugar is just not good for you, mate. Now, listen, sweeteners also have some issues, but just maybe look at that one. Uh, at certain times, it is sprinkled with the fleeting feeling of nostalgia, only for one to find it to be underwhelming or even greater than what they remembered. In the end, there are enough people who will flat out just take both at face value and consume what appeals to them. This elaborate premise is all to ask one question. Now, realistically, a question about the philosophy and art of creating a narrative would be better, but priorities are set on Kool-Aid. If you had to drink Kool-Aid, what flavor would it be? Right. What I don't understand about the question, basically, is that those last two sentences genuinely make it seem, I'm being serious, that you just want me to tell you what flavor of real Kool-Aid I actually like, even though you used it as like a metaphor, 
Whereas if you hadn't have put those in, I would assume that you wanted to ask metaphorically what type of Kool-Aid I consume in as much as everyone to some degree could consume some. So I have no idea what flavor Kool-Aid because like the only times I've ever had it, it wasn't particularly delicious. So I, I have no idea, maybe like grape or something. Maybe, I don't know. In terms of if I answered the question otherwise, I thought it was a very unclear question, quite frankly. I would say this, that... The narrative, or in this case, it's almost like ideology I tend to consume at the moment is probably more like aesthetics. Like, essentially, like the good, the true, and the beautiful concept of like beauty interacts, in art at least, with what is true and with what is good, and that hopefully there should be some connection. It's why actually I think a lot of art is degenerate and actually as a result, inherently lacking in soul and what really makes it art for my money. So I would say aesthetics, like I want narratives that appeal to inspiration, greatness, um, embodying something, representation of something in the world, an abstract idea represented tangibly. So those are the types of narratives I find very appealing or delicious in the context of Kool-Aid. Animosity, in your opinion, is Simple versus Zewu comparable to a LeBron versus Kevin Durant debate for number one player in their profession. Right, first of all, I'll link it in the description box. I actually just wrote one of my most recent pieces contrasting some different elements of Simple Versus Zero that you probably haven't considered. Again, it's not like an enormous piece, but there's some pretty, pretty interesting thoughts in there, I think. I would say yes, but probably not in the way you imagine. Like, first of all, the Durant angle, he hasn't really been like the Durant of old fully yet. So it's not really that appropriate. I also don't think LeBron is quite the LeBron of his peak. I think people classically do that with every top player because they acknowledge guys get better and better. And sometimes they have better teammates like Tom Brady. People act like they're at their peak. Like their peak was ages ago. So let's not be silly. So my problem here is it's not that appropriate. Like... I actually think um, that's why it's a good comparison. Because in my opinion, Simple versus Zewu for like best player now is a good comparison just because no one else can compare to Simple. So if you have to force someone into the conversation, yeah. But my problem is it's not that appropriate overall because most people don't really mean number one player now. They tend to mean who's the greatest of these two over their careers. And that is where the issue comes in. So if you try to do that versus simple as Z, well, I also have an issue there. So like the problem is Kevin Durant started in the NBA four seasons after LeBron. So really you'd have to wait till they'd had like an equivalent amount of seasons or the, both their careers end to really compare. I also think as usual, you've got the whole team versus individual angle. Like I thought Kevin Durant was a better individual player than LeBron at times because LeBron's style necessitated needing teammates so in that scenario i actually did think kevin durant at his peak was better than prime lebron uh although then again the real prime lebron for my money was the 2013 lebron and i don't think he played like that for more than like maybe two or three seasons unfortunately i think he then reverted back to the team style of player understandable to some degree but i'm not the bigger fan of it um there's the whole angle that, like, winning becomes overbearing. So if Zewu's team is better, then he's just better as a player. Like, okay. So, I mean, that's just a thing people do. So hence, like, if LeBron's team was winning, he's better than Durant. But if Durant's team wins, like, it's just such a whack way to do it. Like, you've got to look at who they are and what they were piloting, basically. Uh, I also think in the context of those players in the NBA, people almost never bring up defense. There's two ways to the game. Like, it's not fucking air helmet. You don't go out and have a defensive player come in. You play defense as well. So why did no one ever contrast how, how well they play defensively? Like, I actually think, quite frankly, Kevin Durant should put in a little bit more effort on the defense. He could basically be offensively like Michael Jordan and defensively at fucking Scottie Pippen. Like, he should actually have put a lot more effort in there. But then again, in the modern day, you get injured playing defense. Like, people have just fucked the rules for it, unfortunately. There's also factors, much like the example I gave of Super Z, where I had that article where people never consider these factors when talking about they just go on rings or scoring or whatever why does no one ever bring up who's good at uh, uh, shooting free throws those those points matter every game you know? that could be like 10-15 points every game for free if you're good at it and LeBron's never been that good at it and that's quite frankly a massive flaw in his game also we're on late game free throws you know how many fucking games I saw Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant win just by making like you know 5 out of 6 free throws or 4 out of 4 free throws and just win the game off it when the other team keeps trying to foul them for possessions but can't get anywhere because they just make both that's a factor. That wins you a lot of fucking games. How about three-point percentage? Like, one of my problems with that one is, I actually think that during the era when Golden State Warriors were winning all their titles, even before Kevin Durant went there, LeBron actually didn't focus on the three-point line enough. He just thought, right, I get the ball to the three-point shooter, and he makes a shot. It's like, no, mate. You should be taking more of these threes. First of all, they'll have to honor your drive a lot more, even though you're older guy now. He wasn't back then. 
But also, if you remember, 2013 LeBron was the one where not only was he posting up more and he was playing way harder on defense, but his three-point shooting went to like 40% on like three attempts or something. You should have scaled that. If people have never looked it up, here's the concept that in the NBA changed the NBA. People figured out it's what percentage of three-point it is, but that's of three. So contrast that against what that percentage would be in two-pointers and suddenly it's like, holy moly, you should have been taking like six a game with that percentage. It would have been worth it, seriously. Then there's the whole thing of, you clutch but people let that overbear obviously so anyway yeah similarly i think people are very simplistic and go was he we've scored as many frags so he must be as good it's like, we've got to look at the teams what they're doing what they're piloting what they're competing against essentially as i always say if it, let's consider the formula one example is michael schumacher a worse driver before he has the best car because he's not in the best car it's hard to, I mean, it's not as simple as he's the best driver in the worst car. You have to ask what they're doing and what the challenges are, but people don't do that in, in eSports for some reason. So yeah, sort of. Impulsive. Could you share some techniques slash principles one ought to keep in mind and utilize when trying to improve at writing essays? So, okay. Remember, I'm not an expert in the sense that I can only speak to what I've read in my approach. Like I never would claim to be like an expert in like creative writing or something. What I would say is this. Someone I found very influential in terms of writing was actually Christopher Hitchens because he um, he just didn't put on pretensions. Like he would just straight up say, find people. In fact, continually read people who are outside of your field and who are the greatest writers ever. I'm talking technically as well as in terms of like sentiment. Read their stuff and just realize, fuck, that's how far I am off them. That's how good they are in that area. That's how lacking I am in that area. If you only look in your little field or your peers and you go, hey, I'm pretty good. Hey, I'm the best. I'm way ahead. You're never going to be the best you could be. So as a result, I would say, yeah, to go and do that, that's a really serious aspect that you can go to. I'll give you an example. One of the reasons in esports, I've always enjoyed reading the work of Fion. Fion on fire on Twitter. Used to be of ESPN Esports and Yahoo and The Score. Is because his ability to like tell a story in text is actually better than mine. I can tell the story and I can hit the key points. I can sometimes set it up. But his ability to sort of like use the iceberg theory of um, Hemingway and say a few things that actually sometimes somehow imply or touch or reach out beyond what he's writing and touch a certain aspect of what that represented in a play. He's very, very good at that. So I love to read his stuff and go, fuck, look how bad I am at that in comparison. So it makes me have to think about it when I start writing. I would say in terms of some real just straight up tips... I like to order my points. Doing Thorin's thoughts things help. Doing articles over the years helped. What I had to learn to do was the, the highest value in when I'm doing the order is coherence. It's not chronological order. It's not giving every detail. It's coherently telling a story. So sometimes you'll have to skip around to make certain points and put them where they're appropriate and then call back maybe if it's a separate topic. I would say a massive aspect, one of the most overlooked aspects again from Christopher Hitchens is to avoid cliche. The second you find yourself going, well, he's a really calm player. Oh, he's a calm, cool and collected. No, say it in your own way. Use your words. Think about it. It will give your writing so much more punch than cheating and using the little macro someone else felt in because it isn't your words. Because those aren't your words, rather. I would say set up properly. Like, one of the things people don't understand is when you've written the article, how am I ever going to get to the good part of the article if the first part's not interesting or doesn't draw me in? Like, here's an analogy a lot of ghostwriters say. They say the first page of a book should basically be considered an ad for the book because a lot of people are going to pick it up like in an airport or bookshop and start reading that. And if that isn't sick... They're putting it down already. So I would say in this sense, use the pyramid technique. Tell the story, write the article, then have the first paragraph be the article summarized in a, in a paragraph and have the title be the article summarized in a title, in just a title, a sentence, but in a, with, in a pithy and interesting way that draws you in and says something, but doesn't say everything and makes you want to read the rest. I would also say finally on that level, a massive mistake I made for a long time in my career was writing the article and spending fuck all time on the title. And as a result, I'm sure plenty of people never clicked. So spend like a good 10 to 30 minutes on the title. Or maybe if you've got some cool people on your focus group, what a good title could be. I've suggested many titles for many people's shit. Even one very quick one. I think when Travis wanted to do like a Thorin's Thoughts, I just like suggested, why not make it like Travis Talks? I think he did it. Like it just makes sense. Right? It's not even a genius one. It's a very simple one. It's just an example. 
Similarly, there was a question that was quite similar, actually. Crazy Leprechaun says, how do you edit your written pieces? Right, I will say that's something I'm actually thinking about a lot at the moment. Like, I'm going to try in the future to get written pieces, write them, but then not just release them and send them out there and not just only spell check them, but actually spend time rewriting some of them and see if I can change some of my style and improve certain aspects or make a certain type of writing that I'm not that good at now. Because... Even though, don't listen to other shitter journalists in esports who go, yeah, you have a problem with writing and editing because they're just like bitches and slaves to the, some of the most dog shit editors I've ever met who just cut out the heart of their piece. But I do think not rewriting things and not going back and considering sometimes this part should be taken out, that has been a major weakness of mine in my writing and it's what I'm going to look into. I'd also say another thing is to learn to be able to write in sections is something I would like to do because if people don't know, much like everything else I've done, I approached it my way and then just let, iterated a bazillion times till I got really good at it. So if people don't know, all of my articles I write in one go from beginning to end. Now, maybe now I set up the structure a little bit like some basic notes, but I just start writing and I end. And that's it. Typically in one go. So if you think, that ah, can't be possible, that's because I put a lot of time into this and I wrote a lot of art because it was probably quite ropey back in the day and sometimes it didn't hold up. I've got a different path than other people. I've done the Robert Frost taking the lesser, less well-trodden path, right? I wouldn't necessarily say that's the best approach, though. You want to be able to incorporate many techniques, right? Sometimes it is an incredible piece. That's why my JW piece, that'll link in the description box, probably no one else in esports will ever write anything like that. Shikes, what do you find most rewarding about your work? I mean, this is really just philosophical, isn't it? So I get to say what I want to say about what I think, about who I am, how I am, and how I see the world. I'm, I can be uncompromising in my work. I give people their due, whether they're good guys, bad guys. I, I would say one thing I would hope I do, this is when I think my work hits its best peaks, and when I think actually my work can ex exceed a lot of basic journalism, is when I'm able to sort of show people the transcendent in the profane, or maybe the mundane would be better. Like, at the end of the day, it is just a video game match. But I can make that Greek tragedy of the most epic variety if I hit the right tone, theme, set up descriptions, etc. So, yeah, probably that aspect. Animosity again. Even though Breeze, Drew Breeze, has some of the all-time NFL QB records. Pause a second. I will just say QB records mean a lot less because... We've only had like, what, a decade and a half of a lot of the rules that we have now, which basically crippled the defense and made the game just about passing a wide receiver. So even though Drew Brees had some of his period, like early on when some of those rules had changed, it ain't the same. Like, like I, I, you can't, in my opinion, you can't put people like Drew Brees against people like Dan Marino, except in terms of longevity. It's comparable in that sense. But okay, even though Brees has some of the all-time NFL QB records, how much does it hurt Drew Brees' legacy that he likely has fewer playoff wins than Joe Flacco? Joe Flacco was, of course, the quarterback, most famously of the Baltimore Ravens when they won in 2012. It would have been 2013 in terms of the Super Bowl, I think. Um, and he won where famously he's got like a mad amount of touch, like 11 or 14 touchdowns over the run. It came in as like an underdog team and they had no interceptions. So it looks like on paper, one of the best quarterback runs of all time. I mean, in theory it is one, but it's just like not the best or whatever, just because it says on paper. Uh, I would say not much, quite frankly. I consider Drew Brees a significantly greater player than Joe Flacco. So I, I'm confused if you were trying to imply that Joe Flacco is even comparable to him. If you're just saying that if someone who isn't as great has a better record, yeah, that doesn't look as good. Like you want their quarterback to have everything if they could. But the problem is the NFL is a team league. It's all about, it's a team sport and the famous 6 defense wins championships. And to some degree, it still does just need a lot more offense now because of how much offense has changed. So, but you still need some defense. So in my opinion, the problem I have is this. During most of Drew B's career, particularly with the Saints, his team sucked defensively and they were all about offense. He had offense-minded coaches. So until he was busted up, that was basically the case. Now, when he started to get busted up, and was just playing like a very good game manager style, or in the last few years, just throwing it to fucking Alvin Kamara, then, yeah, like he had chances to win then, but he wasn't Drew Brees then at that point in time for me. He was a shadow of himself. So, in my opinion, 
This guy gave a monster effort in like the late 2000s, early 2000s. He was a very, very good player. That is when he was a very special player. Like there were years, in my opinion, and actually that's around the prime of Tom Brady, where you could very much have argued certain years he's better than Tom Brady. I mean, his precision was unbelievable as well. So, and I'd never thought he actually had quite as much offensive talent as for, for such an offensive minded team as you'd imagine. I think of some of the fucking weapons Tom Brady and, and Peyton Manning had over their careers, mate. Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees would die for some of these weapons. So I actually think during that period of time, he could have won more rings if he had a better defense. I actually think he even could have stolen some easy rings. I won't say Brady stole it, but like he certainly wasn't at his prime when he won this season. I think he could have had some easy rings, quite frankly, if his arm and body had just held up a little bit more in the last three to five years when actually the Saints put some really good teams on the field. It's just a mixture of bad quarterback play in the playoffs. And... I mean, I've never thought Michael Thomas was actually as good as he was rated as. Like, you know, he's another one of those guys who thinks he's a bit overrated just by getting all the yards. Yeah, basically, like, I think he could have even got rings then. So if he has three, four rings because of cut the last few years as well, would that make him, like, greater than fucking Dan Marino? Or, not, um, yeah, Dan Marino, Peyton Manning, most of them. Probably not, right? It's not really fair to do that, but they didn't get them. Is that... You see my point? Now, I actually think Joe Flacco is a bit of a mystery. Like, he's one of those players, you have to compare him sort of to like Eli Manning, maybe, where you can't deny they played very well piloting what type of a team they had when they won. It's not like they had loads of offensive weapons in terms of Flacco, because obviously it was mainly a team that spent their money on defense. So that's my problem, though, is he did play well within the context of the team, but I look at it and, like, first of all, his team had some god-tier defensive players when he won that ring. Sure, like really, was at the end of his career, he's still a very intelligent player. Ed Reed was still a monster. Suggs was still a beast. Um, the, the quarterbacks obviously never got the fucking shine because of how big the rest of the team were. The overall defense wasn't as sick in the regular season. That's why they weren't a top team. But even so, like, I looked it up. The opponent scored 30 points or more four times in the regular season. That's still a very nice team to be a quarterback of. He was sacked something like four times in four games in the playoffs due to the way they reworked the offensive line. So that's going to help you look like a god. <laughs> when Eli Manning was making some of those god-tier throws in his runs, you saw he was like fucking like... It was like someone was shooting a sniper rifle at him and he was having a dodge before he took his shot. Like... This guy definitely had the help. He also, as a running back, had Ray Rice, who, let's face it, like, he would have had a very interesting career if not for other factors. Like, that guy was a monster late 20, 2000s, early 2010s. Like, that guy was really... So if you have him, it opens up your throwing game a lot more, right? The pass, play action. Uh, he did ball out, though, with monster throws. I mean, even the bullshit one against the Broncos. Like, hey, fair play. It's a monster fucking Hail Mary. Broncos would have won that year. I'm telling you, though, that was the fucking criminal one. I think the problem here is careers have to be more about just more than about just the playoffs, especially in the NFL where you play so few playoff games. People think it's the opposite. I disagree. You play so many regular season games that that also is the main body of your career. So as a result, like in my opinion, here's an example. Do you look at the season Aaron Rodgers just had, where he was the MVP, justifiably so. Like, he was working with way less offensive talent than fucking Patrick Mahomes. Do you look at his current season and go, right, this year was a failure for you, Aaron, because you didn't win the Super Bowl? No, because, for example, when he was playing the NFL NFC title game, for example, he didn't have his, like, star offensive tackle. What? That's not going to help you as a fucking quarterback. You think he was getting sacked for no reason in some of those games? Like... You have to factor these things in, but no one does. They'll just look, how many rings does he have? And did he win a ring? That's the problem with the reductive way that people look at quarterbacks. So anyway, you get my point. That's something Drewby is a very great player, but I think his numbers got inflated by a mixture of his coach and uh, the era he played in. So for me, it's more like he's probably a top 10 quarterback of all time, but I would have people like Dan Marino above him still. And Dan Marino never won a fucking ring, mate. Zumba, which league player is trying to piss their legacy away in NA the most? Ooh, there's a bunch of angles I could go with this. So I've pulled up the LCS. Right, I've got to say, uh, I think the winner is probably... Here's the problem. It's how you define legacy. Most people think of legacy as like your whole career. I think like if you've done really great things, having a year or two that aren't that good afterwards, don't take away from it. So I don't think any of these players really have totally destroyed their legacy. So it's more about who needed more in their legacy. Like for example, Sword Art isn't helping his legacy by playing in TSM and playing in LCS and probably not going to win LCS and not do anything internationally. That doesn't help considering in terms of the public optics, he had all that time when he was really, really good in flash holes doing amazing upsets. And then he had the run to the finals of Worlds with Sunning, all these rookies. So as a result... 
to me, rookies. As a result, he had a very special legacy set if he retires at that point in time. Instead, for some people, he's going to tarnish it. Not for me, but for some. But I won't say he's the winner. I actually think the two most obvious ones would be, I think, Jazuki. Because in my opinion, you just can't play his style of mid lane and side laning in LCS like you can in LEC. I think, in my opinion, he should have been the Fnatic mid laner. That's what actually would have been the better move for both people. So I think he's wasting his time in LCS, no matter what Peter done for us for him. And I think one that I have to mention is probably going to shock you is Someday. Because if Someday is really only there for the money and he had LCK offers, that's very disappointing to me then because he made a lot of money and he could go back to Korea. There are a lot of top lane gaps in Korea for top lane, for really star top laners. He could make some of the elite teams even better and potentially be a world champion and win more LCKs. So I think that actually in some ways tarnishes his legacy if indeed they want him. I'm purely speculating there. I don't know this name because I think it's like Turkish or something. It's like Dzoriz says, or Polish potentially, what does methodical mean in CSGO? How would a non-methodical player look like? Is slow and methodical just the phrase or is some team playing fast and methodical as well? I do think you can play fast and methodical. Like I would say some of the MSL teams probably did that at times. Like they still played a quick up-tempo game with people like Config AZ, but they played methodically. Like we're going to follow this path and this protocols. Basically, methodical to me is like there's a structure to how you play and you try to almost check things off the box or each thing follows and maybe a flow chart approach. Existence teams were like this. Doesn't mean you just go slow though. You don't have to be like flip side tactics or VP to do this. So in my opinion, yes, slow and methodical is unfortunately a cliche that people spam. As soon as they say one word, they're going to say the other word. That's the issue. But I would just contrast it this way. You can be a low IQ beta who plays slow, not particularly methodical or methodical in a negative sense. And it's not a good thing. You can play chaotically and there's nothing methodical about it. If you want to ignore technique that people use, rushing was out without checking certain corners. If you want to ignore protocols of flashes and smokes, maybe furious spirits sometimes do this. I think that can work as well. So yeah, there's a sense for it. Carl says, Thorin, do you think aliens exist? Right, this is actually a question that'll be perfect. Listen, I know I've said this in the past, but we're probably a few months away now, now that I've left Flashpoint, where I will probably will have a Patreon and an AMA and a side channel with stuff like this. Well, it'll be on my side channel rather, but I'll answer this. So here's the thing. Obviously, I could cheat and go, well, yes, there are people from other countries who exist, or well, there are things that are different completely radically in your mind. But I'm going to go with like the def dictionary definition of coming from another world extraterrestrial. That's typically what people mean by aliens. It's a better term, by the way, extraterrestrial. Because what you mean is some sort of like life form that's not from Earth. Now, in that kind of a scenario, do I believe in it? Or do I think they exist? No, because actually I've become very skeptical of a lot of like the pop scientism type bullshit. And I think most of that's nonsense and psyops. And so as a result, uh, I, at the moment, actually, I go the other way. I have less conception of what could possibly be outside the realm I live in than anyone else does. I don't use movies and silly things that scientists say that they have no business seeing or nonsense maths equations that I don't understand. I don't use any of that shit to even go with that stuff. I, and quite frankly, a lot of the stuff I see, even tangential to the mainstream about this topic, looks very much like intelligence agencies are involved and they're spraying an agenda for their agenda and I can't know what their agenda is and a lot of the stuff there's something to it but it's, it's what you call pissed on breadcrumbs like I don't buy a lot of it so if instead we want to go this angle the idea that like from another world in the sense that like the human world they're not from the human world so you could say dimensions or a different reality or something that's where it gets interesting in my opinion like I could first and foremost just take it philosophical and go, if you want to go the Alan Moore approach or how he approached religion and why he became a magician is what he wrote in From Hell. It's like, you know, only in the, whatever it is, the confines of the mind can we say without argument, whatever, that, you know, gods and demons, etc., exist in all their terrifying and beautiful glory or whatever it is. Like, yeah, they certainly exist in our mind. And in our mind, well, something about the mind's real, whether or not it's just ideas that we can't get out there, whether that could be the imaginal realm, by the way, check out Promethea if you want to know more about that. I think there's something to that. So even if they don't exist, they do exist in our mind and can be more real than something that actually exists tangibly, knock on wood in the world. But if you want to go with that approach, like other dimensions, I think it's a more interesting angle. Maybe there's other land in this realm that you haven't been told about or people refuse to acknowledge or is off limits or we're not even allowed to consider. That's more of an interesting approach to me and where I think there's probably some juice. I just wouldn't claim to necessarily be an expert in that regard. Too big, yo. 
says, who of the big three in men's tennis is your favourite and which one do you think is the best? Obviously, best is a very fraught term, but we'll go with both. Like, my favourite is easy and it's Roger Federer. Again, aesthetically, I don't think anyone could fuck with him, really. At least no one as great as him as a tennis player, nobody in the big three. Uh, I appreciate them all very much, though, especially from seeing their battles against each other. That's been one of the coolest aspects. Uh, I do think the whole surface angle, modern technology, injury helped is what's allowed them to be the big three and probably the best players in the history of tennis. I think some of the other players are comparable and even racket technology. Um, like I will say, I think you can still make a very strong case Federer is the best. I think the cool thing about them is in a way you can make a case for all of them being the best. I think the ones with the strongest cases, in my opinion, are Federer and Djokovic though. A mixture of dominance, a mixture of like how they win, not being helped by one specific surface as much. Yeah, that's the main aspects. I would just say this, Federer already has that status. And yet you think about how many times he was in situations that like so totally could have gone his way by a fraction. People like Djokovic, I don't care what people from the Balkan region are going to tell me. He hasn't been in as many of those, in my opinion. And a lot of those mans that he lost... Yeah, he was just the second best player or the other guy actually outplayed him and stuff like... I think he can... Aside from the periods when he went a bit nuts mentally and had his injuries, he can fairly sleep soundly at the end of his career. No, he actually won maybe more than his fair share at times. I think Federer's one of the only players ever who has the most Grand Slams ever and might not even fully have won his fair share, as bizarre as that sounds. So, like, he could easily have won Wimbledon 2019. Imagine winning that at his age. Nobody ever mentions how many World Tour finals they've won mainly because it was Federer versus Nadal and the Nadal fans just constantly don't mention who, who well, at least they, they've become a lot cooler since Djokovic became the best, but they just didn't want to mention that. That counts. That's like, what, three quarters of a slam? Federer and Djokovic way ahead in that regard. Just look at what Federer did from age 30 onwards. What an unbelievable career. He had like a, a great career for an all-time great 20 tennis player just from age 30 onwards when in the past, when injuries used to hamper people, 30 was the end of your winning time. Like I looked it up. He's won three Grand Slams since turning 30, been in seven finals and 13 semi-finals in something like 25 Grand Slams he's played in. So over half the Grand Slams he's played in, over 30, playing against other people in their... Like, this is nuts, guys. He's been... He's won eight Masters 1000s titles. He's won three World Tour finals. Seven times he was in semis or better. Oh, no, sorry, he was in the finals three times. Seven times he was in the semis or better. And remember, because he is five and six years older, respectively, than Nadal and Djokovic, we have to see what happens with their careers before we can fully address it, right? I still overall think he's the best, because it's not just about titles for me, it's also about style of player, how you played, who you played against, all that shit. But I don't mind if anyone wants Nadal and Djokovic. I certainly think Djokovic has a very good case to be the greatest of all time, and I have massive respect for his mental um, fortitude on all surfaces, and I have insane respect for Rafael Nadal's heart. Captain Useless. Whose roster spot do you find the hardest to justify at the moment? At one point, it was the $4,750 decoy adren. And then the non-French, I meant the French one, 4750 decoy Smiths. Zeus has come and gone. Who's the LVP, least valuable player, now? Maybe it would more politely be more politely phrased as which player do you think benefits the most from their veteran status? Right, I don't care about like Freiburg on fucking Dig. Dig aren't relevant to me. So I'm going to pick from relevant teams in the world or teams that could do a lot or maybe are doing a lot but players just isn't that good. The obvious two to me are Flamey and Tarek. Like, Flamey, by the way, now is not a young up-and-coming player. That was ages ago. He just never made it past where he's at and he's not even that appropriate as like a third fragger and I don't think he can play the supportive roles that well. So quite frankly... He should be on, like, something like a gambit or a VP. He's inappropriate that he's on Na'Vi. Tarek on EG. Listen, I had a lot of time for Tarek even when he had bad numbers when they were winning because I heard so many things and heard some of the comms that sounded like he was doing a lot in the team. He's just not good at fragging the last six months or so, three months. Like, he's just having too bad a time. In my opinion, you've got to get someone else in there to do that. I get that NA doesn't really have the support roles, but imagine if that had been someone like Kooster or something. That would be a very interesting scenario, right? I know he doesn't talk as much, but... You can't just put it all on one person's shoulders. Barbara Stanwyck's legs. One of the great debates in dual games is that of spawn slash respawn systems. I am interested in your general thoughts on this and or how different systems measure up in specific dual games. 
right? The main area that I personally, I know you're going with respawn, and you don't probably mean it in terms of like the character, right? The big problem there is when they were random, yes, you would literally get games, especially with too few spawn points where you just spawn the same spawn point and a guy sits there with a rocket launcher, lightning gun, whatever, and just kills you over and over again. You give that guy free, five free kills, it ruins a game. That could easily be solved by just putting a bazillion spawn points everywhere. Even so, then there's no tactics and strategy to where did this, like, that's why it's a very, very fine line to walk. This is a tightrope topic, guys. I'm personally more interested because I actually haven't thought enough about that topic. Other people would be better for that than me. I actually think the weapon control angle is a more interesting one. Like, in my opinion, I think a really missed alternate branch we could have gone down was early Quake and Net Quake had weapon spawns as in you can't just all run over the rocket launcher or wait five seconds that rocket launcher might take 30 seconds to come up so now you can control which weapon someone has and how they play and where they go that not only makes an extra layer of control in duo which is why people like thresh were so dominant but also crucially for my opinion it actually provokes the map designer to put in more thought to how he designs the map or tweaks the map or updates the map. that's where it gets very interesting and it was a very sexy potential separate approach at you know chain of evolution we could have gone down if we'd kept that but sadly we got rid of it because players just prefer to have a weapon and be able to fire the gun in the game so that was always a problem for me tam or ta capital m says i have always wanted to live in korea but i don't know anything culture etiquette or language apart uh, related apart from traveling there for events slash work was there any preparation you did relate to those things before moving there no i basically just went there for a few weeks, I thought, this is cool. Went there for a few months. So this is fucking cool. Since I didn't need a visa, I could keep leaving every 90 days or so. I just went there a few bunch of times. Eventually, just sort of lived there for like a year and a half, like what, two years, two and a half year span. I would say if you want to know some things about it, like culturally, the best thing you can do is be there, obviously, but you're not going to speak the language. So I would say there's a couple of books I always recommend. There's one like Korea, the impossible set country or something. The one called the Korean mind. These books will give you a good sort of grounding in what it's about as a place. It is worth learning some very simple parts of language, as in, you're not going to learn a language, it's incredibly difficult, you have to stay there for a long time, put in a lot of effort every day, but very simple stuff will get you really far, hello, sorry, thank you, please, just say, oh, like, bring this, like, yogi your attention, waiter, like, basic things like that will get you so, so far, you don't even need much more to eat and to buy things. Etiquette, I would say, is more important than actually knowing the language. Always be polite. Understand what is polite to them. Understand what they don't like. Like, you know, in certain countries, if you go and stick your hand up to someone, they'll be offended. Under I'm not saying Korea is like that, by the way, but but think about it. Understand. Remember, they bow in their culture. Like, learn some basics. That'll get you very, very far. Because then people will give you the benefit of the doubt, some leeway, and then you can get around and do what you want to do. So I would just say I had the sense of it from games, which turned out to be very different. And then I went there and I just loved a lot of aspects of it. Um... Tangential question, Rudy2k1 says, in your Haunted by What If video, you say that you had an affinity for Korean culture at some point, but as of late, you don't as much. What made you change your mind or see things differently? Um, the whole incident with LS and T1, which I've never done a video on because I'm not sure it's an appropriate topic. Maybe I will in the future. I, although I sort of did one on my side channel. It's, I just saw too much of the dark side because of that incident. Like, I already knew that the chair balls were on some sort of Blade Runner, Game of Thrones level shit in terms of how they controlled things. It was just more overt there. Just Westerners don't know. That really showed it to me. Uh, I think there was inside tampering involved in that case. Let's put it that way. Reminds me of how the Bushido code and the Samurais go too far, hence why I made that Ned Stark video. Like, there's aspects about it that are beautiful and I can admire, but then they go, like, they, they just go to the nth degree with it and go too far. And then, as a result, like, like in my opinion, following orders when it's the corrupt orders is just basically violating your own internal code. It's not just that you follow orders unquestioningly. Media control there is a fucking joke. I don't care what someone says if they pull up some index like, oh, no, it seems it's fine. That's because it's a friend to Western countries. Do you still not figure out that? Oh, but these people who are notorious for lying told me it's not the case story. Like, grow up, kid. Figure it out for yourself. Especially seeing those fans attack me directly, BTS Army stand style, just made me think, fuck a lot of this culture. Because basically there are very massive positives and there are massive negatives as well, as you find with most cultures. So basically, I kind of had it, was looking at it through rose-tinted glasses until I kind of came home. I'll also say, even though their esports culture produces the greatest players to ever play esports, it is actually almost horrific the way it treats even those great players. Like, it just burns them out and uses them up. They're commodities. The Esh one 
says, Hi Thorin, your Thorin query episode from a few months back on Honor, the one I was just referring to, really resonated with me. Since then, I have spent a significant amount of time thinking about the concept of truth and have developed my own philosophy on the subject. My question is this, when studying philosophy, do you believe it's best to develop your own thoughts about a topic independently and then consult literature afterwards? Or if you are interested in a topic, read up on it first and then come to your own conclusions afterwards. Perhaps it is an iterative process. Thanks. First of all, all learning is an iterative process as far as I can tell. You've got to constantly revisit, question. That's why actually you've got to doubt yourself in a positive way. You've got to just question, is that the case? Question is maybe a better way to say it. Like, go back and, and reassess things, reevaluate, reflect. So I would say this, it's not an either or, and there's not really a simple approach. Essentially, the reason why I often find this confusing, although I don't because it's coming from young men, is because my philosophy would be like this. All of my best thoughts are my thoughts. They're no one else's, even if you heard something a little bit similar elsewhere. And I would even say, isn't that the one quality that makes my content so appealing, no matter what I'm talking about, that it's so essentially me and the way I think, and even that can update, yet it still remains me. That's the thing. That's why genius steals and talent borrows. It's not that you go, right, these people are really smart. I made the mistake, mistake of people like Krista Vitchens. These really smart, and that's a great argument. So I'm going to take that for now while I don't have an argument and I'm going to use that as my argument. No, you don't ever do that. What you do is you go, that's a great argument. But do I fully understand it? It's exactly what I, you, you, you interrogate, you grill it, you really think about it. And therefore, the process of encountering other ideas or even thinking them up yourselves basically makes them your thoughts. I think it's a flaw of a younger man to take what sounds right elsewhere, could be in science as well, or mathematics, and just say, well, someone smarter than me seems to have figured out. So maybe he's right. No. Only what makes sense to you is right at this moment in time. And constantly reevaluate that, of course. Otherwise, you become a monster. Matthew Underwood says, I'm curious about this recent trend of what I perceive as content creators becoming more closely connected with their audiences. You've put yourself into direct conversation with your fans through multiple avenues, and I'm wondering if that's affected your relationship with them. Do you find that their expectations of you have changed? I'm most particularly interested in if you've had trouble dealing with overzealous fans trying to be your friend in real life and how you deal with that. I would think it would be a constant issue. You may be particularly well suited to the situation, so without naming names, do you know of other people who have had problems and how they deal with it, thanks. Most of the people seem to have a nightmare relationship. They either go like the influencer route, like you're all my mates, if you ever saw me come have a beer or a picture, it's like you're opening yourself up for so much there. On the other hand, I think in the past, people like me and Richard have been very standoffish, like fuck all the fans because we just see too many negative comments and we think, well, the other ones aren't even giving us any money anyway, they're just clicking an article for free. So I would say that's where it's changed, is that by getting in contact with people who actually are willing to directly financially support my work, who genuinely care about my work, are polite, ha have interesting discussions, it's shown me that it's a needle in a haystack, but there are cool people out there who like my work. And so in the future, I prefer to go towards an approach where those are the people that, I mean, I've always somewhat catered to them in the sense that I'd make my work anyway, but I want to directly be involved with those people. And instead of just paying for some shit mainstream media stuff, give me a bit more of the money. I'll give you some extra stuff, some extra access, and let's make some cooler things. Like, that's a better approach to go. I'd rather have a thousand dedicated people around me than millions of hits of randoms and plebs and 14-year-old kids going, lol, big oof. Like, I don't, I don't care about those people. They are nonsense. So if anything, yeah, it's improved it. It's made me think more of certain aspects of it and try to ignore some of the more negative parts. And like I say, I think other people, unfortunately, are fucking, they're lost at say with no rudder and no sail, quite frankly, and no oars. Madman2980, you've said on multiple occasions that you would have liked to coach Soaz back in the season four, season five era. He says, what are, but who are some other LOL players you would have liked to get the opportunity to coach during a specific era of their career? And what do you think you could have helped them improve on or change their perspective on a particular aspect of how the game was played? Like, by the way, it's actually Soaz for his entire career. I just think he's a very special player who was actually underutilized many times and was never given the credit he fully deserved. So, so as any period. Um, I'll probably make a video on this topic, but I'll do some quick thoughts now. Febovan is one, it might shock you, just from chats I've had with him and things I've seen him say. I think the last couple of years, he's really piqued my an interest intellectually because he at times can be a deep thinker or he wants to be a deep thinker. But here's the thing. 
He won't just accept anything. You have to win him over. You can't have any goff. He can see through it if there's goff there. So in my opinion, I think I'm one of the only people, if I coach you on that level, could get to him. So obviously I wouldn't want Febber in 2021. I want Febber in 2016. Give me Febber in 2016. All right, here you go. Here's the fucking line for you. And I'll make him a greater player than Bjergsen ever was. I'll make him a guy who has some of the best international results ever in League of Legends. Because I think Febovin's talent was immense. I think it was his mindset at times, and especially his decision-making and what teams he went to and how he was coached, if he even listened to the coaches or how he wanted to play. I think I could have got to him. Now, I might use some crazy shit. We might have gone to the fucking desert and taken mushrooms. We might have had, like, fucking Zazen sessions before games. We might have had incredibly deep philosophical... I might have basically treated him like a fucking son or like I was his uncle or something. That's actually how we might have had to do it, but... I think we could have done something special. Double lift's an obvious classic one. Again, I think the ideal one would be if I could have had him in like 2013, 2015, 2016, basically before he took the splits off. I think that's the double lift again. I could get him over his mental hop. I could, I could get him out of groups at Worlds. I could get him some upset series wins over people, assuming he plays like the way I'm imagining I'm talking about. I think he basically could have been a top 5 AD carry to ever play League of Legends. I, I didn't say from the West. I didn't say from any. I think he could have been that. Jensen's one. I've always fucked with his mindset. I know he can be lazy though sometimes, or sometimes he gets annoyed at something. Or he thinks this isn't worth it. So again, I'd like to help polish off some of the rough edges. I'd like to help explain to his teammates who Jensen is and what he's trying to do there, and then set him free to be my superstar. His talent has always been obvious, but sometimes he and his team, they sort of nerf it a bit, don't they? So maybe season six Jensen for that. I mean, even season eight was still very good. Um... Dardock was a classic one if we're going back to 2016, 2017. I mean, listen, I'll just say this. Good luck being rude to me, mate. Not that, like, I'd just wreck you only. Like, I'd diffuse I'd, every one of your things. I'd be like one of those, like, fucking Star Wars prequels where when they fire, like, blaster bullets at them, they just block every single one of them and even, like, block one back and hit you with it. Like, you wouldn't be able to fuck with me. Not least because I won't say more, but I know a lot more about Dardock's personal life and history than probably anyone watching this video right now. So as a result... I think I could have reached him in a way that none of the Orgoners coaches and, and teammates could have. I think he could have also, put it this way, he at least could have been what Exmithy and Meteos were to NA. And that was one of the positions they were lacking another one of those players. Odoam, there's one I've always had a great appreciation for any point in his career, but particularly if I could have had him from season seven onwards, I think he could have been an incredible, he could have been basically what Zoro Zero was looking like he was going to be at the end of season four. I would have turned him loose more. I would have had times I'd made him the star. I would have still used him weak side. I had a very strong AD character. I would have, this guy could have, been, basically, if I was going to make a greatest team of all time and I can coach them at the time in their career, I might take Ordo Amna as my top laner. I know Wonder's done it the last couple of years, but I don't think you've seen over his whole career fully what Ordo Amna was capable of. If you want to go a weird side angle, I'd like to coach some people as a content creator. I sort of do when I'm a mentor figure or friend to them, etc. But I'm not joking. In some senses, I would like to coach LS as a content creator. I think I would know what topics to get put on his channel, when to address them, when to address the media, when not to, when to be a part of shows. I definitely, by the way, would fix his fucking work-life balance and get him more help there in that regard. I'd get rid of some of those fucking naysay. Uh, some of the yes men rather around him, some of the people who I, I think actually can at times be harmful for him, but he just he doesn't know how to say no to them or he thinks they're his friend or they have done things for him. He, I think he has a similar problem to Loco and Reggie in Loco's re that relationship with Reggie in that sense. Like they can't get rid of some of these toxic relationships. Similarly, I actually would have said Cadrill in that scenario last year, although I will say some of the things in the last few months have sort of turned me off that a bit. Like I don't really know that he actually cares to do the kind of content I'm interested in or go down the route I'm interested in. So I think actually maybe he just wants to be an LEC caster or he just wants to be thought of as a good... I think he wants to be like EU Isale or something like that, you know, or Kobe. Like, that feels like more the angle he's going, so maybe it wouldn't be appropriate. But I would have said him when I saw him just as a player and I saw the potential and I already knew from talking when he was a jungler he had a good mind for the game. Lagger 15, let's hope and assume PGL Stockholm will happen this fall. That would mean two years between the majors. Shouldn't the format be updated as well? If so, how would you build up the event format? In theory, it should be. I would say this. Make it the most mega major of all time. Have it be a major where you have some crazy, like, huge best of three GSL group or 
Swiss system type approach with amazing seeding and reseeding. Make it like a month long tournament. Give it like $5 million prize purse, like 2 million for first place, 3 million for first place. Make it fucking epic or maybe make it so last place gets good money as well. Make it like a TI almost. Yeah, build it all up. Make it the biggest spectacle with breaks so we can do media around it. Make it so it's such a celebration counter strike after all these many years off that it almost makes us glad that we went through what we did, even though that's probably not what we're ever going to think. We wouldn't really, just as a sentiment though at the time. Bring all the best talent, even the greatest people from the early years and have them be in some capacity a part of the event, even if not directly on the broadcast, in the desk, etc. Maybe they could be on like side panels or side stream or something. Make it blow the fucking doors off it, man. Vigar. In the HLTV top 20 players of the year, if you were to include both players who was in, were in, and who missed the ranking, who do you think they misranked the most? Right, I'll probably in the future, maybe I'll go back and do it for the past ones, do a video each time they complete their top 20. I'll just do a video where I analyse it in that way, because I actually thought of this topic many times before. I've done my own before, and therefore it's just an obvious piece of YouTube content. Wouldn't take me that long, right? The trick, in my opinion, to understanding why they make some of the weird moves isn't just, although they do do this, that if you're in one of the elite teams that wins a lot and places high a lot, you're just going to get up there, or you can't get up there if you're not sometimes. But more importantly, I've noticed as well as the EVPs, when they put those notable stats at the bottom of the graphic, that seems to sway them. Like, if you have a lot of top 10 ones on those, you can just leap to, like, sixth in the list, even though if, like, the eye test and everything else says, this guy was, like, the second or third best player in his team. Those can help you up a lot. So as a result, there's a little trick for you. I learned that from when Fallen was like second in 2016, which I think is mega egregious because he played with the fucking first. I think an obvious one, I'm going to hurt people's feelings. I'm going to start at top and go down electronic. He wouldn't be able to have all those series at the big events with a great rating to get the number if he didn't have Simple next to him. Come on, man. That's like rating Scotty Pippen as like the fifth best player in the NBA when he plays with Michael Jordan. Come on, he was a top 10 player, top 15 player at times. Wasn't that good, though, was he? That's never factored in, though. One of the flaws of their ranking system. I don't think he was anywhere near the fifth best player in the world last year. Like, my next guy is an example of someone I think should probably be above him. How about Rops? Rops is a monster, but he's carrying a bad team. He's in a flawed team and a team that never really was that good online. And so as a result, what do you know? He wasn't able to get as high as Electronic. It's kind of whack if you ask me. I think Dupree is way too high because of the results of Astralis and probably some like big event start or something. I think conversely, where the fuck's Config? He's Danish and anti fragger too. He had to do way more in his team and he was a monster at times. I'd have Config in the top 20 at least. I'd probably say this is more debatable, but if you want to go on an edge case, I think probably Mantu deserved to be in there from last year. You might go, but what about big event? He still was in a lot of event. Remember, just because they put a category of big event, I don't let that be my god. People from Serbia don't tell me what I think about Counter-Strike. Maybe have your own mind, guys. Ask Blaster 2000, years ago on Summoning Insight, you and Monty said that LCK was more difficult and Worlds was more prestigious. Has your opinion changed over the years? If it has, at what point did it change and why? It has, but only in as much as the LCK has changed over the years. So in my opinion, before it was called LCK, OGN Champions was harder than Worlds. There was way better teams there. Sometimes the four best teams in the world played in OGN. And so only three can go to Worlds. This is when I was not the right three. So, of course, I think the Korean exodus, which is when LCK started, hurt. I think the rise of the LPL hurts. a more competitive league now. Arguably winning LPL is harder than winning Worlds. Um, I think, unless the best team in the world is Korean. I think Riot changing the game. Obviously, that hurt Korea. Buffed L LEC. I think it made individual players stronger in some ways. Even though, like... You still have to have the team concept that you can't win. You just look at what they did to vision control. I think macros less, less methodical and it's a little bit more about gambling at times. So that it hurts Korea and Korean culture and the way they think about the game. And Korean teams just don't spend money the same way in the era when money is what largely dictates where the talent goes. Like it was okay back in the day because only really NA had some money and no one was going to go to NA back then. So... In the era when China has lots of money and NA even has money to keep people like someday potentially or bang, yeah, that's a problem. Korea's not going to be as good. So it could be better than Worlds though tomorrow if you let me change all the rules of how the region works and they've put a bunch of money in. Kolja G says, I remember your analysis of NAF's E-League Season 2 performance and that he usually never performs that well. Has there ever been such a transition from being an average support player to a superstar like Naf in CSGO before or after? I'm not really sure he was ever a true superstar, except maybe in the Renegade experience, and even then they, they didn't really like 
They played a lot of tier two, let's be real. No, in general. Although I will say it's slightly cheap because I'm not sure he ever was a true support. He used to fucking still hybrid up from that position. I think those Optic teams were more like high-level pogs, which is what a lot of the NA teams have been like. Cloud9, in terms of the one that won the Major, Team Liquid, this Optic team, Dazed teams. It wasn't really like he was a Sean Gares team support. So, no, but I also don't think it entirely fits him. I will say it's a massive player progression, and there aren't that many that happen. But then again, also, because NA players tend to be a bit mentally weak when they first start out, I think that's why they end up getting like four or five times better. But, but no, in terms of like role and where he was in his team, I don't think you could probably really find one that's as crazy in that sense. Peyton Lee Trahan. Hi, Thorin. If you were to make your dream North American lineup, which group of five players would you put on a team together? Right? I'm going to do it for now. So if I had to do it today, I think I would make like Elise as my main star. Really nice style of play. He's actually more now like a mixture between passive and aggressive play. Like he will play like an entry pack at Centra, et cetera. And you think he's really mastered when. Basically his goal button has gotten very, very good. Uh, I think he's the best possible star player you can have on this team. I'll take twists as well, because I think with the right team, he can be a fantastic player. And I'm purposely on this team not going to take naff, so there's room for twists here. Now for my like third star, I'm going to make it more of a fragger, but I want someone who I don't think is that appropriate to be a one or two in terms of mentality. So I'll take, maybe I would take Floppy. If he's still available from Valorant, I might take Automatic. If I want to go to a more classic route. I think these guys could do a really good job filling in that role. And then in terms of my supportive elements, I'm going to have Stanislaus. He's even going to frag half decent in terms of like eye test. And he's going to obviously just call simple mid-round stuff for this team. And I'm going to give him Rush as his entry slash supportive player to help set up the twists of the world. I think Automatic can play a little bit more towards the supportive side if we need. I think obviously in this team, Automatic can do a little bit of orping if I need. I don't really need a primary orper and it doesn't really have really good primary orpers right now, quite frankly. So I think it's a banging team, actually. The status law angle is a little bit dodgy because he could be up and down. But I think this team could do a lot if they were in the kind of form I imagine. So... Zeno Dwarf. I know I made the mistake before saying Zeno Dwarf. Because um, I suppose pronounce it in a British way for some reason. You mentioned before that if you weren't in esports, you would like to be a comic book writer. What classic character would you like to make a run on and how would you explore it in ways that haven't been done before? Are there any ways you think you could push the medium forward like an, like an Alan Moore or Jodorowsky? Right, I've got to go a little bit light here because I may well end up doing this and that is not a joke. So I would just say generally my approach would be in the style of Alan Moore, like what Alan Moore did with Supreme as a way to tell all of his Superman stories and variations. So I would like to, first of all, do a Supreme style, like classic Silver Age look at it and just a love letter to that. But I'd also like to then take it and then Watchman style, twist it into something I think would be interesting. So a classic one I've always loved is John Constantine, Hellblazer. I just don't think he's had enough great writers. It was mainly early on in the period of that book that I had the great writers. I would love to just take that and then tell all the kooky stories and thoughts I have. Like, I'd love to go into some real world secret society shit, go for the hardest angle was possible, go into like question, I don't know, fucking NASA or something, you know, go, go fucking balls deep on it, mate. Like blur the line between a comic and reality. Now, I don't know if you could ever make that comic, probably have to be done independently or unofficially, but be interesting, right? One you probably don't know would be Resurrection Man, if you know that classic series by Dan Abnett and Atlanting. Lanning. So much could be done with that. It's a character that every time he dies, he is reborn. But like he, I can't remember if he has amnesia or something, but basically he gets a different power at, at random. Yeah, that's the ultimate character. You could write incredible stories about that. Think of some of the powers he could have. I'd maybe even have him go into like, I know this is mad concern the earlier question, but maybe have him leaving this realm. Maybe he goes to other dimensions. You could do everything with that one. You could interact with any character you want with that one. That's one that just shows that comics have lost their way. As a classic one, I'll just throw out there. How about Monel from the Legion of Superheroes? Think of Superman, but instead of Kryptonite, it's lead that is his Kryptonite. Well, obviously, the joke there is he used to put lead behind, in front of Kryptonite, so Superman couldn't see through it because Superman can't see through lead. So, what I would do is I'd use him as my Superman analog to tell like my Superman stories by putting him on a planet that doesn't have lead, but then people get hold of some lead a la Kryptonite, and then I'd tell all my Superman stories, but without having to be Superman. Because guess what? Getting put on Superman's pretty fucking hard. I can get put on that Mon-El if I become a writer who works for DC. Then again, why the fuck would I work for DC? 
In terms of like, could I push the medium forward like Alan Moore or Jodorowsky? I wouldn't do it unless I was going to do that because I try to do that in every field I go into because I try to make it what I think. I don't go, this is what the medium thinks. You learn the rules of something and get good at the techniques so you know, you know the basics of the field. Then you break the rules when it's necessary to, to advance the field. So how about this? One area I've already thought about that I would love to do is I'd love to do a comic. So it's a comic, but it has like footnotes that either have their own section there or like an appendix at the back or they link to online links. And it's a way to open your mind to all these different topics and aspects. And so I reference something and then you go down a little rabbit hole with me. Maybe I mentioned the Cathars, then we go read the Al Alba Janine Crusader, we go read about that or something. And it'll be making the most fascinating comic ever. Or how about Grant Morrison style, doing an invisible style, like engagement with the community. But now we have this online community. So maybe we, collectively we build some sort of egregore with the work and we do try to do something in the world with that or in comics with it or in terms of fan base or how our fans are thinking about it. Basically, one of the things I would say defines both of them, why they advance the medium, they both refuse restriction. So as a result, I mean, uh, there's a great quote by Crowley, the English mystic and magician of the 20th century, who said, the word of sin is restriction, O oh man. That's, I mean, he's doing poetry there. That's what I think. So, very interesting. Connor Rabak says, what advice would you give to someone visiting or moving to the Northeast, I assume it means of England, do's and don'ts, interesting places to visit, etc." Right, first and foremost, here's just some simple ones. Mind your own business. People don't like it when you stick your nose in around these parts. You're not going to get the same politeness you might from elsewhere, but a certain base level of politeness is expected. Like, don't fucking stick your nose in other people's shit. Gradually get to know them. Don't go too hard, but be polite, be amiable, have a reason that they'd be interested in talking to you, build it up slowly, and you'll find these are sort of the earth people. I would say stay where it's appropriate. The thing about the Northeast is very interesting. It reminds me of a lot of um, places that have a bad reputation. You can live there and never run into any trouble if you stay where it's appropriate and you know when to go certain places. If you live in a shithole, you are yourself someone who's within a bad crowd. You can have the worst time in your life. Think about living in a ghetto in a major city or you could live in an awesome part with all gated community. I'm not saying live in a gated community. But you get the analogy of the contrast. I would just say this. If you've never lived in England or you've never lived in the northeast of England and you're used to a scenario where it's like, wow, the HR person would fire us if we fight. Let me just say, give you this very simple rule. Don't flex on anyone. Don't try and be a tough guy unless you are and unless you want that fucking, unless you want that smoke because you'll get it. Don't have pretensions. Don't try to constantly show off how intelligent you are and your vocabulary and that you don't come from the place. They're not going to like that. Like people who come from the ghetto, they almost have a pride in coming from the ghetto and not being super well educated. So you've got to sort of soft sell that. Still be yourself, but don't make them feel like they're lesser than you because you're bringing up something they don't know. Find a way to make it seem like just something cool you're bringing up to them. I would also say, by the way, this is what place to go. Soak in the countryside. Go to the Yorkshire Moors. Go to the Whitby in the seaside. Go to Scotland if you get a chance. It's fucking unbelievable vistas. If you're, if you're into like romanticism paintings, this is, is it shit. This is what the shit was based on. Just go enjoy it all. In terms of like places to visit, hmm. I mean, I don't really want to give like a restaurant guide or whatever. I have to say, one reason I'm actually selfish and I don't give out like direct tips like that is I don't live there anymore, but I don't want nutter stalkers coming and trying to meet me there. And I definitely don't want it somehow getting famous in a way where it gets shut down or they ruin it. And blah. So I'm a bit selfish in that regard. I only tell friends, that sort of thing. I would just say this. If you've never lived in the Northeast before, if you've ever had fish and chips anywhere else, you've never had fish and chips, mate. Go to the best places in Whitby, Red Car, etc. The fish and chips there, get the scraps with it as well. Just to, don't get the other one. Get the cod battered with the chip. They'll be the best you'll ever have in your life. Put loads of salt and vinegar on, way more than you think. Loads of ketchup on, more than you think. Two or three times more than you think. And then try eating that shit and tell me that isn't straight fire. I would also say an underrated aspect, not just in the Midlands, they have these very good curries. If you find the best place in the Northeast. What else? That's largely it. Yeah. Maybe because you need like Yorkshire, have some shepherd's pies and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. Django Tango. Do you think esports developers are obliged to provide support for disabled players? Colorblind modes are a good start, but some abilities in League of Legends still have global audio cues with no subtitles. Scion slash Cled Ultimates, for example. Right, 
It's the word obligated that is my issue with this topic. Obligated in what regard, by who, and for what end. Like, I don't think anyone who makes a game is obligated to do anything except what they want. They're making a piece of art from their soul, I would hope. I know they're not in the modern day. It's, 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 we have to be more cynical, but you'd hope that, right? So I would personally, as a general approach, we're talking philosophically, rather that either disabled people or people who have reasons to care about disabilities, very, it's a massive cause for them, a driving factor, a motivator. I'd rather they got together and made some cool games and be crowdfunding them themselves if no one wants to pay for them. That would fit specifically people with certain disabilities like the ones that they're interested in. I think that's a cooler aspect to go with. Again, don't take someone else's shit and change it. But you know what? If you want to go with how can we change League of Legends and CS Go to... My angle would be this. Instead of changing the game, how about work on like specific peripherals for certain disabilities that allow them to compete at a similar level in some degree and makes it better for them? That's pretty cool in my opinion. I would support that more than sort of going down some woke nonsense or like bullying fucking devs, if you know what I mean. Bean bur I will say though, if they're gonna get walk, yeah, they look like dickheads when they won't then put basic things like that in, because it shows that they're only doing it for cynical marketing reasons. Bean Burrito, the big one, says, who are the top five IGLs in CSGO history, taking into account personnel at their disposal, etc. I don't know if you knew this, maybe you did, but I actually did this video already. It was gonna be one of the do not peak videos, like those other ones I did, and basically, I don't know if it was ever edited, but I fell out with scoots and do not peak as a result. So it was never released. Now, I, I didn't directly follow Do Not Peak. It's just that Scoot's project. And most of the people involved in the project went out of their way to openly insult me publicly, sometimes directly to me. So now I'm just done with all of them and I have no interest in them. So I think it's kind of sad that it was unreleased because I, I did the whole narration and the whole script and everything. But I'll give you the gist of it here, even though I'm not going to do the whole video, but I'll give you a very sort of quick version. Right, first of all, I did it in 2020, March. So maybe I would slightly tweak this since then, but we're talking about their whole careers. I think it's the most undervalued role in the game. You look at the best teams in history, odds are the best IGLs are the ones leading them. That's how key a position it can be. I think the value is incredibly high in terms of the longevity that those great people have, far exceeding any other esports games and roles as far as I can tell. So I have at number five, Pronax. He's got second most majors in history. He had... Second, two different types of lineups to win some of those majors. His team was like defaulty. His mid round reads were sick. He did them all at the right time as well. He's kind of like Tom Brady in that regard. He's not necessarily the best player at that, like like a fucking dig route, like small type passing. Maybe Breeze is better than him, but the difference is he does it at the right time, seemingly without fail. And he just knew how to use his players. In some ways, he is kind of a Tom Brady of, of that position. I don't think he's ever individually the best, but. What an exceptional IGL and props for his career. He had the right personality for his teams. He was relaxed. He was a problem solver. I don't think he would have been as good with like a godlike tactician role or like strict teams, but okay, he had the right teams for himself. Number four, I have Zeus. I'm ignoring the end of his career, as in the rest of it's so special it, it makes up for it. He was the general style of captain, as in a military general. He was a drill sergeant. He's good at enforcing his style and system. You will play the way he wants, which is slow, which is run the clock down, which is fakes into execs with lots of variations. But the playbook works, guys. On CT side, he stacks, but he stacks in a way other people can't get away with when they do gamble stacks. It works. He was good at working with AWPers. Look at Guardian and Simple and Markolov. He was a consistent, I and mean, obviously Markolov not in CSGO necessarily. He was a consistent grind-out style IGL, which has always been one of my affinities. He always had a good map pool, all times in his career. Mirage, Inferno, Overpass early. Train and Cobble later. Longevity and consistency is bonkers. We're talking like 2013 to 2019, still relevant at elite level. Only really had 2014, maybe not elite. And obviously didn't coach part of 26, wasn't IGL for part of 2016 in Na'Vi. Number three, I have Carrigan. The best of all the list, in my opinion, working with talent. So many different lineups. Radically so compared to his peers. Three different lineups, top two in the world. Still finds success and betters the players that he's with, even if they're really good players. You look at the Dig TSM Astralis team. You look at Phase V1 that was making legends at the majors. Look at Phase V2 with Nico, one of the best teams in the world winning titles. You look at Phase V3, the super team. You look at Mouse Spot. This is unbelievable, guys. This is unbelievable what this man has done. Truly, truly special. He really is like a Jose Mourinho of... Uh, should be Jose Mourinho, actually. Yeah, apologies for that one. It's Portuguese. Jose Mourinho of fucking IGLing. 
Stars peek under him, whether that's Device, Dupree, Cajun Bean, Eco, Rain, Woxie. You, you get the point now, Twists. Like, he's just so good at bringing out the best in his stars. A special, he's almost like the star whisperer in that regard. He's so quick at making his teams work. He hits the ground running. Obviously, Mouse was different, but it had its own reasons for that. It wasn't as good a lineup, quite frankly. He gets a strong map pool very quickly with every team. The Super Team is the only example otherwise, and quite frankly, it's because, in my opinion, they were fixing it until Olaf went and disappeared for a while, and that cash flex would have been the game changer. The King of Pick Ban, very good at kind of like giving himself good matchups all the time at the top end of CSGO and giving his team a chance. His style's difficult to read and respond to. You have to kind of just hope he breaks down. It kind of reminds me of Peyton Manning in that regard. It looks like it's stripped down, but it's more in-depth than people think, and his conditioning style is one of the best in history. I think he's the hardest to pick in terms of position on this list. I could go number one and number two. I really felt like going number two here, but I ended up going with number two, Fallen. He won two majors back to back from a region with zero expectations to ever win a major, even to this day. He won many titles. He was essential to remember that in 2015, 2014, before he had the best players, he was taking lesser names to top eight at the major consistently. He was overperforming. He had his team with a great philosophy when they had weak players to win with the numbers advantage. Barring beating bigger teams in series, he could do it on the single maps. He could beat the bigger teams, especially on Mirage. He could really get it done. Then you go 2016, 2017. He's arguably the best in-game leader. Massively impactful on the style of his team. Programmed his philosophy into the players, which is a game-breaking philosophy. Sure, what could let me put him below Carrigan is I think some of that also was called Zero implementing it. But I still think it was game-breaking. It changed the game. I think he allowed players like Cold Zero the room to work and be the best. I think Cold Zero ever looked as good without him. His map pool, it'll seem like a meme now, but he had lineups which had mastery of the map pool repeatedly. It was a strong fragger and opera at one point in time. Fragging, not as relevant, but it fits into the style. I do think it's, it was a bit overrated for fragging. It was more like how he made it work in the team. But I think giving his team a tactician that is their opera can get early in phone kills and make the enemy play further back. And then if he's allowed at the end of the round, win the clutch. That's pretty OP right there. That's pretty special. That shouldn't necessarily be entirely everything for an IGL, but it played into what he could do as an IGL, right? Number one is, of course, Glaive. you got to give the guys credit. Not just because he won the most majors, but he was very pivotal as to why they won a bunch of them, right? He didn't have a simple or a Zewu or an Eco or a Prime Shocks, in my opinion, or Get Right. So I think he was an amazing tactical in-game leader. I remember back to his Copenhagen Wolves days in early 2013 scene. This is unbelievable. And he's the best now, like, what, seven, eight years later? That's special. His tactics can be out of this world. Only person, I think, who can actually fuck with him on that level is existence before 2016. Before the Magus the 2017 lineup, he really showed individually how he would operate. He made the key player when he needed to. He was an entry at significant moments when things could go against the team. Stylistically, that slow tactical style has always been good. He knows when to go fast and necessarily force the defense to play honest. His lurk style all over the map, you need the right players for it, but it's, it's almost unbeatable, as you've seen. It's the best style ever to strangle out a team and win as many tournaments and have as top placings as possible. It's incredibly difficult to execute and adapt with his style, but he makes it work. He gets the 10 out of 10 level of execution, and as a result, it's probably the best style you can have on paper. So what I would say is this. The biggest impact for me is the style. Like, Exist wasn't much of an impact on the style of his team. Carrigan is more than people think. People like Glaive, Fallen, and Zeus have huge impact. So it depends how much weight you put in winning the big one or winning the major, right? It matters to me, but it's not a deal breaker. So I only really use it to penalize like existence in MSL. And that's why they couldn't make this list. Fragging, I think it's only a minor factor. Otherwise, you know, like Happy would be higher. You'd have to put like, blame F. He wouldn't be on this list, but you know what I mean? Blame F would be relevant. Like Fallen would be maybe number one. Who knows? I will say the only name I would maybe change if we're going more off the personnel angle is like existence because I think he only really had two and a half years in CSGO where he actually had the true elite talent that he needed around him to make his style work. He didn't have the talent around him like Glaive did except for like two and a half years. So I think he could have been on the list instead of Prodax. Miguel Macias says, how come when the NA GOAT discussion is brought up, it's always just between Bjergsen and Doublelift, but never ex Smithy? Are his years without Doublelift on his team underrated? Season 3, he carried Vulcan with Mancloud and qualified to Worlds. Season 4, yikes. 
Season 6, he won spring against the TSM lineup with Bjerg and Doublelift on the team, then went to MSI and made finals. Summer, they got fourth, but still qualified for Worlds. Season 7, joining Immortals in the spring summer split, replacing Dardock, turning that team around and qualifying for Worlds. Season 10, yikes, obviously Doublelift the rest of the period. The problem is this, I can give you a very simple answer, it'll explain it very concisely, but we can do a topic about that one day probably. He's a supportive jungler at his best. He's not a star in the traditional sense, even of a jungler, except when he was in Vulcan. And that was much earlier on. That was more about mechanics. I don't think the role allows you to actually be the goat of a region or the game, quite frankly. It's the most fucked with role by Riot. They flip it so that it just isn't the best to be supportive sometimes on certain champions in the meta. You have to consider other regions. Where are the goats in their regions that are junglers, right? Which jungler's a goat contender? There aren't really any. You have to go like four or five names deep before you get to a jungle. So I would say that says more about the role than that's a result. I don't think he could be. Here's the difference. I could put Doublelift and Bjergsen on teams, win, go to Worlds, and maybe even do something without Xsmithy. If I don't give Xsmithy Bjergsen Doublelift, you notice on this list here, or Jensen or something, what did he do without those three players? Because of the role. It's not his fault. Kristen says... What do you think of the owners in NA trying to remove the import rule? Would you remove the rule entirely, adjust it in some way, or keep it as is? Now, obviously, we discussed this a bit on something Insight and elsewhere. Maybe I'll do like my own video separately on this. I had a different style. I, I think there's three major approaches that you should go with. Either remove entirely, make it all about NA players, and hence play up the entertainment and develop the best NA talents. Make it, you enforce it entirely, but you're allowed imports. Maybe I went the wrong way there. So you're, yeah, it's enforce it entirely would be like, just make it no imports. Remove it entirely, let everyone import, in which case it's about who's the best GM. It's a cool approach as well. Or go with a third option no one's brought up, which is you're allowed as many imports as you want. This is a banger. But for each import, it's like the luxury tax in the NBA. You pay, and I would make it a cool angle. I would make it like you have to pay... Um, you have to match the salary that that player gets paid and it gets paid into a group and it's shared with every other team that doesn't have an import or there's a modifier based on number of imports. So as a result, basically, if I sign five, six Koreans imports and I have the best team in the world, I can have it in LCS and I even have the best team in the world, but I've got to pay some of the money. I might have made it too much making it match the salary. I'll just make it totally implausible. Some You figure out the percentage. Make it so that then, I, if I take that team, the team that has all NA players and really maybe does try to develop talent and actually do a lot with them and be more of a min-max business, they can use the money that I'm paying from the imports to then take and buy some of those players and develop the talent. It's a very clever approach. I don't think anyone else thought about. So there's some food for thought for you. GDMN says, I was wondering if you were paying any sort of attention to the ongoing Quake Pro League or the recent finals where Rafa continued his ultimate reign over the scene still. I'd recommend checking out some Razy matches. His LG is unreal and looks like he and he and looks like he's the most likely contender to dethrone Rafa this season. A nice international LAN is something I am looking forward to with a couple of key jewelers in mind, hopefully in the fall of 2021. I do in as much as like I watch Coolers games or watch like a classic game people say, or I watch like the finals and the playoffs. I'm not like super into it like I was in past years. I'm very impressed that people like Rafa and Cooler are still relevant and can still be championship level players. And people like Kilson keep going. Uh, I've seen a few Razor games, certainly our skills. I think he's lacking a little bit mentally that he needs to pick up, but he hasn't had enough of the lands, in my opinion, to get there. And especially in the era of Quake 3, Quake like blah, 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 where everyone else kind of was battle tested and forged in the fires of war. Um... So yeah, I do. And yeah, I also agree with you. I hope we have big lands coming back. I hope one day I get to a position financially. I could potentially sponsor quick tournaments and leagues and structure them my way and give people like six months to practice for it. That's like a little pet dream I have on the side. So who knows? Maybe we'll see one day. Grelden94. I asked this question a few months ago, but accidentally typed FPS when I meant to say RTS. What do you think about the modern RTS genre in terms of esports and casual play? It seems to be dead at the moment. If a new game came out, what would you want for it to push at least into tier 2 esports? So first of all, we kind of addressed this a little bit on the Crackdown episode with Monty about RTS disappearing and stuff. It's in the latter part of the show. Um, first of all, any 1v1 game has major issues right now being a top esport, a tier 1 esport. Just for some reason, team games, more people are going to play and watch. 
you can up bait blamed as much, blah, blah, blah. It's not as hard. I think generally 1v1 games are too hard and too taxing for plebs, so the player base doesn't get high enough, and therefore the game dev doesn't think it's worth putting enough money in. The game dev needs to put a lot of money in if it needs to be anywhere near a tier 1 esport. And I think, quite frankly, since it's RTS and the greatest RTS players came from Asia, you must have Korea and China heavily playing it, otherwise it won't be as interesting to me. So there you go. The last question is by Daniel Hambrace. Now, this is a long one, so let's read it. In the Aristotelian line of philosophy, there is an idea of two extremes united by its meaning together, forming something stronger than its parts. Okay, similar concept to like the coincidentia positorum then, okay. For example, Fantasia, impression of senses, and the mind, imagination and thought, forms the two extremes that are united by the mean of reason, logic and reasoning. I got this from Radar's Nobleza de la Espada, 1705, in which he uses this to break down fencing and form a strong philosophical core of it. If you were to break down CSGO in a similar manner theoretically for how it is to be played, what would the two extremes be and what is the mean that unites them? Would it be possible to generalize it to other games slash esports sports? Right, the last one's ridiculous, mate. I'm not gonna like do a whole philosophical thesis and then just do all the other games as well. Like that's like a four-hour video. Maybe I'll make a separate thing where like for like a fucking hundred dot two hundred dollars you get your own video. And then again, I wouldn't want to make all those videos. Who knows? I don't know. We'll figure out some angle on something like that. I actually have something similar where maybe I'll pick some of these and people will vote on them, like I said before. So we'll, I might start doing that for next month, and maybe this can be one of them. I'll say this. I think you should have given a few of the thoughts on the fencing part so we saw how it applied and drew us in a little bit. Because without it, I'm just guessing how this would even apply to CSGO. Like, I don't even know if I fully understand how you're thinking of this concept because you didn't give me enough of your thoughts on it. You just explained a basic concept to me. So I would say the most obvious one in CSGO is that the loose style of play fits the individual more strongly and allows them to shine but takes away from some of the team aspects. But for the team to shine, you need structure, and structure somewhat limits what the individual can do. It's basically the marriage of the two, through, call it what you like, team play, how the IGL separates the division of labour, how you structure the roles in a team. This is what brings them together, makes the great teams of all time, right? So, in my opinion, I think a team like SK is probably a very good team from 2016. An example where they had, on the one hand, good tactics, pretty good team play, a nice amount of skill, the right people having individual aspects, the right people restricted. Like, I think essentially my three pillars are what bring it together, the three columns, right? So I can't say much more if you don't give me more info, mate. If anyone wants to get a question in one of the future ones, $10 or more at the Patreon link in the description box below. This video was kindly supported by Bobby, Lager15, Pronogo, Zachary Carter, Andrew, Alexander Rao, Andreas Crockneys, Animosity, Dean Tanglas, Eric Hillestad, Hades, J-Dubs, Jensen Go, Tobias Bernasconi, Xyrathenia, Zumba, and as always, a special thanks goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my shows? Do you want to ask a question for my monthly video AMA? Want teasers for who's coming up on my content? Or do you even want to take part in one of those exclusive discussions with me about esports? Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Scaluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.